So right now we spoke about from employee's perspective. Let's talk from employer's perspective. Sure. Let's say I hired someone, I spent a lot of money on, on his wages, on his training. Uh, let's say he, he stayed with us only for three months. Okay. Uh, but he, he's leaving the company, okay. right? Because of that, I will be having a lot of losses. What kind of verbiage I need to include while releasing the offer letter? Because most of the employers just take some random template online and use it as the uh, uh, offer letter, right? So what kind of measures the employers have to take to protect themselves? Yeah, so employers, so I wouldn't just rely just on an offer letter. I would also have a very airtight employment agreement, mm -hmm. right? The agree offer letters are very short, right? They're a page long, maybe two pages. You can't fill a lot of legal language in there to protect yourself mm -hmm. in that. So mm -hmm. you're going to put a lot more clauses in there mm -hmm. that'll give you protection in an employment agreement. Right. Um, so we have a whole team dedicated just for these agreements that mm -hmm. can draft them for mm -hmm. you uh, and get them sent out. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these clauses can include anything from um, preventing the liquidity damages, which we talked mm -hmm. about earlier. That's a great mm -hmm. one because you don't have to specify this or that. You could just say if there's a breach, we'll get this money automatically. And it's very mm -hmm. easy to get. And we'll also have an attorney's fees mm -hmm. provision Understood. where if you breach, mm -hmm. not only will you have to pay the uh, liquidated damages, but if you don't pay it on time and we have to use an attorney, mm -hmm. all our attorney fees are also mm -hmm. the employee's responsibility. So we put um, language like that to give some additional protections to the employer. And there's a lot of clauses mm -hmm. and each clause is gonna be jurisdiction specific, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends where you are, we're mm -hmm. gonna tailor that employment agreement to your jurisdiction. Understood, understood. Let's say, I opened up a company. I'm a brand new business owner. As you, as, as we are talking this, uh, I feel like having uh, employment agreements in place uh, and want to follow some uh, protocols, whatever you mentioned. Okay, how expensive it will be for me to have a an law office like you as a backup to generate employment offer letters or any kind of contracts uh, between um, employer to vendor or employer to client. So how expensive it is? So here's what I will say. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper mm -hmm. than losing one employee. Okay. It's a lot cheaper than losing one employee. Um, mm -hmm. Employees are the biggest asset for any right. company, especially consulting firms, right? That's the only asset that they have. All right. So you spend time and money recruiting, training, and retaining those employees. Mm -hmm. Losing one of them is going to cost you a lot more. So, and, and the way we do it, we, we don't charge you every time we have to do this. Um, well, when you're a new company, we'll draft all the contracts you need. We'll give you templates. Okay. So you can actually fill in the blanks as you get new employee every day. So you don't have to come back to us for every employee. If you need changes to it, certainly we can make fine tune um, the contracts based on any specific individual. Mm -hmm. But generally, a lot of these companies that come to us, we create a package for mm -hmm. them initially. That mm -hmm. includes MSAs, SOWs, employment agreements, offer letters, and a whole host of other agreements. Mm -hmm. And you'll have it in your library when you, you know you have a new employee come in, you just fill in the blank and kind of mm -hmm. submit it. Unless you need specific changes for, you know, you're going in a different tier of employee or something like that. You started off with a consultant, now you're going C-level or something like that, then we can change that up for you. Perfect, 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 perfect. thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I have one more question, uh, probably we can jump on to uh, uh, tenant and la landlord issues. Sure. The last question is, nowadays many employees are working uh, over, over 40 hours a week, okay? On different project. So what's happening is employers are getting contract from another vendor or another client, but utilizing the same workforce uh, on different projects. Like, you know, uh, because he's not running the payroll on them, but the contract is between, um, uh, between employer to another vendor, okay? Sure. He's supposed to pay, pay that money to the employee, either in the form of overtime or, or anything, okay? So here there is no proper documentation. Employees are losing that kind of money from employers who are not willing to pay. Probably, uh, let's say the employee worked for 
for the period of one year, they're paying up to six months and they're not paying for the six months. And these people not having the proper documentation uh, with, with a new project or new client. How can they fight in these kind of cases? Yeah. I don't so, want to talk, call it as second job. Uh, in, many people are doing that, but yeah. what kind of protection these people can have? Well, so there's multi multiple tiers to your question. So let's uh, kind of dissect that. First off, there may be immigration implications, both for the employer and employee. Mm -hmm. um, so Santosh, my partner, is the expert, foremost expert in that. So he'd be able to advise you on the immigration aspect of it. We'll talk strictly litigation. Litigation. Yeah. From a litigation perspective, a couple of things to keep in mind, right? You, remember what I said earlier, document, document, document. So mm -hmm. document this as well. So if you have an employment agreement mm -hmm. with your um, company, let's say, your company's name, your employer's name is a ABC LLC, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. ABC LLC's end client is a big pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. who you've been contracted to work for. All right. And your employment agreement mm -hmm. says, um, Vijay Yellaradigari has to work for ABC LLC mm -hmm. at end client's location in New Jersey at Pharma LLC, right? Right. right. And that's what it says. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't have an employment agreement very specific like that, that's where you get into trouble. Now, in that scenario, you work 40, 40 hours for Pharma LLC. Mm -hmm. Now your employer is also asking you to work for defense contractor LLC mm -hmm. for another 20 hours or 30 hours on right. the side, right. right? There's no agreement there, here. No so when that happens, if your original employment agreement is very clear saying ABC LLC hires you specifically to work at Pharma LLC, you're covered because now you're working somewhere else other than that. So you can then go after them for the additional wages because it's a whole different task that they've assigned you to. But if your employment agreement is, isn't clear or specific, then if they just say, we're hiring you as a salaried employee, uh, ABC Tech is hiring BJ Elardigari as a salaried employee for 100K, and that's it, they can play you anywhere they want. And especially if you're an exempt employee, right? And most of our, um, viewers here probably are exempt employees where they're highly skilled, um, high level positions, they don't get overtime. So whether you work 40 hours or 80 hours, not gonna make a difference from Department of Labor, right? You're getting your salary. Right. So if you have this very clear language in your employment agreement, you'll be protected because you could say, I did my job for Pharma LLC, but now you're asking me to work for Defense Contractor LLC. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be able to do that unless you pay. And again, okay. if they ask you to do that, get a separate employment agreement for that. So you're covered. Got it. Now, Assuming all the immigration yeah. issues have been addressed. Right. So it all comes to the offer letter again. If you, if you compromise for the simple offer letter, like mentioning that you're working for ABC, that's it. You cannot go well, after them. I'm it, not saying you can't go after them. It becomes harder. It becomes harder. Because what, what proof do we have that their, their job didn't include doing both of these? I understood. Right. Understood. Um, understood. Perfect. I think uh, this is valuable to many people sure. here. Uh, and uh, any other scenarios that I'm missing here? You know, you, I can go on for hours just talking about <laughs> employment law. So um, okay. if, if you think of anything specific, I'll be happy to go into more okay. details. Yeah. Okay. okay. I have uh, the other one. <clears throat> Sometimes employers do not pay employees but they try to keep the communication in the phone calls instead of emails or text messages. And while in the phone calls, they, they kind of uh, literally tell them that I'm gonna kill you, or I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Can the employee take any action based upon that on the employer? If he have call recording or anything, uh, any um, proof that he can, uh, produce. So a couple of things to keep in mind when <clears throat> with those scenarios. One, if you're recording a call, be aware where you're located, where they're located, and look up the jurisdictions. Is it a single party notice state or a dual party notice state? And you could Google that, you'll find that information very easily. What that means is some jurisdictions, both parties have to consent to that recording mm. for that to be admissible in court. That's right. In some jurisdictions, it's single party. Mm -hmm. So you're recording and you consent to that recording. It doesn't matter if they consent or not, you'll be able to admit that into court. Just because you have recording, mm -hmm. 
you can have all the evidence in this world. Unfortunately, when we go to trial, some evidence might not be admissible. What that means is the judge or the jury won't even listen to it or look at it. So we can't even use it. Even if it's, if they confess to everything on recording, if it's not admissible, it means absolutely nothing for us. Understood. So we got to be careful about that. But second issue, which is probably the bigger issue here is if you're getting threatening calls mm -hmm. and you feel that you, you there's imminent harm to you, mm -hmm. call the police, get a police report done immediately. Mm -hmm. That will be helpful because if your call recording is not admissible, mm -hmm. the police report would be admissible. Okay. That you you called immediately after this call mm -hmm. and testify or gave a report to the police and the police officer or the report would be admissible uh, to testify uh, against that individual that made the threatening uh, remark. Okay, but what if an employee is willingly creating a scene like he's threatening him? The employee? We're threatening the employee. Yeah, it's not real, but he's trying to create something like employee is threatening him on the phone call, and he called the cops. It can happen. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, it's going to come down to evidence, right? What proof evidence. does he have right. to support that? Right. Um, and then the also to, for example, um, usually assault mm -hmm. is the charge that we would bring on for that. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, it depends on the jurisdiction and they're doing a criminal charge, terroristic, terroristic threats and all that stuff. But assault is what we do on the civil side. Understood. If I'm filing an assault, it has to be imminent harm. If I'm sitting in California and saying, I'm going to come and beat you up in New Jersey, is that imminent harm? Not really, right? No. Uh, but if I'm in the same <laughs> state and I threaten to come and harm you, yeah, that's going to be. Um, I've had scenarios, exact pack pattern, which you mentioned, where I represent the employee and the employer said, you know what, I have people back home, I know your parents back home, I'm going to take care of them, right? right? And they even had people go and visit the parent's house. Wow. Courts here can't do much about it because is it imminent harm? Mm -hmm. Can you prove that this individual is what caused that imminent harm? It's actually a third party that's doing it. Right. So unfortunately, <laughs> the law isn't going to reach over jurisdictions and protect you. Um, so you just want to cover yourself and document. Okay. So definitely employer and employee should always maintain that respectful relationship to yes. avoid all this mess. Yeah. Okay. And and if and remember the, the original question you had, what if the employee just creates a scene to make it seem like the employer is doing that? Filing that police report mm -hmm. is a crime if it's, it's not crime. true. Okay. And if the employer can prove evidence to the police that uh -huh. he fraudulently filed it, the employee goes to jail. Understood. So understood. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.